I'm Lisa Stone, and you are listening to Season 8 of Parenting Aces. Welcome to Season 8 of the Parenting Aces podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and this week we are talking summer tennis camps with David Schilling of Wilson Collegiate Tennis Camps and Premier Sports Camps. David is the assistant men's coach at Ohio State, and he has got some great information that he's going to share with y'all. So I'm excited to do that. But before we jump into that conversation, I wanted to just mention our new message membership at parentingaces.com. For those of you who may have missed the article and all my social media (laughs) posts about it, we are now offering a membership option on parentingaces.com for either $9.95 a month or $95.50 for the year, which gives you a nice 20% discount off the monthly cost. It gives you unlimited access to all the content on parentingaces.com, as well as, of course, the podcast. And we also are going to be putting on some webinars, some camps, some workshops, some parent information sessions, and those will be open to our members first and only after we exhaust all of our members. If their spot's still available, they will be open to non-members. But I want to encourage all of you, if you do find the content on Parenting Aces to be useful and helpful, just click the button and sign up and it's $9.95 a month. And, you know, that's less than you spend on one lunch when you're traveling to a tournament with your kids. So um, thank you for those of you who have already signed up and become paying members of the site. I really, really appreciate it. And let me just assure you that I will be using the proceeds from the membership to get out to more events, to more tournaments, to more workshops, and bring you even more in-depth information on navigating junior and college tennis. So this is not uh, something just to, you know, line the pockets, but rather to allow me to have the opportunity to get out there and really bring y'all more useful information as you go through this junior tennis journey with your child. So again, thank you for those of you who have already signed up. And those of you who haven't, please take a look. The link will be in the show notes. Now let's get to David Schilling and Wilson Collegiate Sports Camps, Wilson Collegiate Tennis Camps. It is a really great episode, and I hope that you guys will check the show notes, click through on the link, and Find the right camp for your child this summer. It will be a great experience. I can almost guarantee it. All right, here we go with David Schilling. David Schilling, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for having me. Well, I, you know, this has been a long time coming, and (laughs) I'm a little embarrassed that it's taken seven and a half years, but here we are, and I'm really excited to chat with you and to learn more and have you share more about the Wilson Collegiate Tennis Camps and Premier Sports Camps and what you do. But before we jump into all of that, I would love to start with asking you to tell us a little bit about your background in tennis. Okay. Yeah. Well, I um, grew up kind of uh, getting into tennis a little bit later than most kids. I was uh, 15 or 16 years old. Um, It was, I was primarily a soccer player who kept getting hurt. And uh, my dad played at a very high level of, of tennis. Um, you know, he was top 10 in, in college tennis. So he played at SMU back in the 50s. And, and um, so I kind of, to be honest, kind of avoided the, the game because it was kind of his game. Um, but as I kept getting um, hurt in soccer, I started playing a little bit uh, of tennis, giving it a try and just kind of caught the bug like right away and, and realized I didn't have to worry about playing time and some of those other things that you, that you do in team sports. So um, I played Division three tennis at Denison University and um, got into college coaching right after right after college. And, you know, the first ten years of my college coaching um, career were at Division three. I I coached at uh, Denison University and the College of Worcester, um, both in Ohio, and then um, was the head men's tennis coach for five and a half years at Kenyon College, uh, another school in, in Ohio. And then uh, 20 years ago um, this year, when Ty Tucker took over at um, 
Ohio State. I joined Ty as his uh, first assistant and um, and have basically been at Ohio State ever since. So Ty and I have uh, are completing our, our 20th year together uh, at Ohio State. That's pretty amazing. But yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people don't realize that I've been there that long. So, uh, but uh, I mean, it, it seems, it seems to have of, gone pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, there aren't a lot of college coaches that have that kind of longevity at one program, you know? And I, to me, it's really refreshing to talk to people like you who have been in their position for many years, who have kind of seen the different iterations of college tennis from, you know, multiple generations now. I mean, 20 years, you're, you know, you're seeing kids and then maybe even the next generation after that, you know, their children. And um, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And so um, that uh, once we start getting our players, kids on Ohio State, it's, I think it's time for Ty and I to, to hang it up. Oh, now, <laughs> come on. <laughs> so, I, I think we've got to, I think our, our oldest kids are, are probably only in the 12 or 13 years range. So we got a few years left. Gotcha. Gotcha. So let's talk a little bit about what changes you've seen happen over the years and how as a coach you've adapted to that. Um, the, the biggest change is, is uh, you know, the information available and, um, you know, there, uh, I would say when I was at Kenyon 20 years ago, you know, it was really hard to to find kids, especially at that level. I mean, I think at a, at a level like an Ohio State um, or, you know, a top division one type of program, the top 20 teams, you know, you, you always kind of had a place to look for those type of kids. They were usually in the late rounds of the national tournament and, and things along those lines. But, you know, that second tier, um, you know, division one or division two or division three, you know, it was often hard to, to hook up coaches with with qualified players and, and vice versa. I mean, I've always been a big believer. My my father was an academician. He was a dean of admissions for the College of Worcester for, for many, many years. He was uh, chair of the history department. He was vice president. So he had been involved in, um, you know, higher education my entire life. And so he always stressed upon me the importance of, you know, um, education and, and, you know, he had a lot of passion for tennis. So it was a kind of impressed upon me that there was a, a, a right fit and a good fit for a lot of tennis players that, that don't realize it. And um, so I think the biggest difference that I, I noticed is just all the great resources out there, um, sites like yours, sites like tennisrecruiting.net. Um, you know, I'm a, I think I, as I told you, I'm a big fan of parent aces. Um, and you and I have talked about how there's, there's still even opportunity to, to gain more information. I know you and I were talking about, you know, kind of scholarships available and understanding, you know, scholarships and there's, there's still some, some areas for, for getting more information out there. But to, to me, that's really the biggest, um, the biggest change The the, the players are, you know, getting bigger and stronger and faster and, and that sort of thing. But, you know, I, I think we have a lot of tools in place today to allow um, families to make good good choices and, and to find uh, a level of tennis um, that that would work for their for their children and for kids to find that. And, you know, UTR um, Universal Tennis Rating is uh, another one that I didn't mention, but is is I think really made some some great inroads on that. So I, I think that's probably the biggest difference that I've seen. And, and um, you know, just just more information. Coaches have more information not only on players but training techniques and diets and you know, weight training and year round scheduling and things along those lines as well. So uh, I would, I'd have to say that the, the dirt, you know, the, um, the growth of information. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Well, you know, there's a lot of conversation around UTR and tennis recruiting and what coaches are really looking for when they're recruiting players. And I'm curious at Ohio state, how much, if you had to kind of put percentages on it, how would you kind of balance how much y'all use tennis recruiting, how much you use USTA ranking, ITF ranking, UTR rating when looking at various recruits? And does it matter if it's an American kid versus an international player? Well, I think that's what UTR has kind of brought to the, to the table. I think it's, it's easier to compare apples to apples um, these days. And, um, you know, it would be hard to put a, 
uh, a percentage on what, you know, each one factors in, you know, we're looking for a lot of vari- variables as well that are, are hard to measure in a ranking or a rating things like competitive drive and passion for the sport and, you know, desire to play tennis year round things, things that are, are not necessarily measurable. And a lot of times you'll see kids that may not have the highest ranking or the highest UCR rating um, that, you know, like myself may, may be late to the game. We have a, a, a student on our team right now that was kind of late to the game. And, and so you see potential um, in those type of players. Uh, but it does help you really kind of get a handle on, you know, not only who you're recruiting, but, you know, who, who other schools are recruiting, um, you know, kind of have an idea, okay, well, we've got a kid coming in from Bolivia and, and we don't know anything about tennis in Bolivia. So, you know, a service like uh, UCR can be, you know, really um, helpful there. And likewise, I think that the kids are, are better prepared if they're using UCR to kind of say, okay, um, you know, I'm a high school junior and I'm interested in looking at, the Georgetown women's team and, and, but I don't know whether I can play there. Well, you know, those junior players are going to have a UTR um, rating and they can, you know, log on to um, universal tennis and, and see what the, the UTR ratings of, of the girls on their team were. Mm-hmm. And I know I would have loved to have that when I was at Kenyon. Um, that would have been just, just incredible because I could say, Hey, you know, look, look, you know, our kids are pretty good. You know, they, these aren't, you know, these, these are kids that are, in the 11s and 12 UTR and, and, you know, sometimes higher 13s. Um, and, you know, the, the top players at division three could play at most division one schools. And, sure. and, um, and I, and I think that that's, you know, uh, was not necessarily apparent in, in the past. So, you know, like, to answer your question, it's hard to put a percentage on it because there's so many, you know, intangibles that, you know, particularly tie tie values and myself and just the chronology, and, um, you know, so it, I think, um, you know, all, you try to put all of those pieces of information together and, you know, and there's, there's no substitute for going out and seeing kids play and see how they compete. Um, so, you know, I would say it, it assists, but it, you know, there's no lines in the sand if you're not a, you know, 14 UTR, you're not a 13 UTR or anything like that. We, you know, we've never kind of gone by anything along those lines, or if you're not top 40 UTF or, I'm sorry, ITF or, Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it's just, just another bit of information that, that can hopefully help coaches and, and players make good, good decisions. Well, dang it. I really wanted you to say, we, you know, we look at this kid and, and the UTR is worth this much in our formula and the tennis recruiting is worth that much. And their ITF ranking is that much, but yeah, I mean, I, I know that that is not how it works. And, and I think it's really important for the parents listening to understand that as well, that, you know, we all seem to place so much importance on, getting our ranking better, getting our rating better. But the bottom line is the intangibles are what what seem to make the difference in most of the decisions that I've heard coaches discuss. And, you know, it's, I mean, your kid is either a good fit for a program or not. And it doesn't matter how great they are or how much developing development they have left to achieve if they're not a great fit they're not a great fit yeah no you've, you've hit that right on the head and, and um and I, I think you know probably 90 percent of coaches would, would would tell you that and, and um you'd like to think that that your program's a great fit for everybody but that's that's not always the case and and, and vice versa it, it right. goes both ways well you know ohio state has done a phenomenal job like several other big programs at keeping the talent in state at your program. You know, y'all recruit locally first, it seems. And, you know, I live in Atlanta. University of Georgia does a really good job with that. Georgia Tech does a really good job with that. Um, Emory University, which is Division Three, does a really good job at that. But it's tough out there. And I know a lot of the state schools, if you look at their rosters, there's not a single kid from that state on the on the roster. What's the secret at Ohio State? How have you all been able to achieve that? Well, it certainly helps to have the J.J. Wolfs and the John McNallys and, and the Justin Cronoggies and everybody, you know, Matt Alaire's, everybody, Chase Buchanan. Uh, it certainly helps to have talent. Um, but it was, a, you know, a very conscious decision. I, I remember the very, you know, 
not a lot of things I remember from 20 years ago, but the very first meeting when I interviewed with Ty 20 years ago, we sat in the old, uh, well, it's the, the current football stadium, but their offices, um, the old uh, the coach, his offices were in the football stadium in the past. And we sat in uh, the cold football stadium during the interview and, and talked about, you know, recruiting philosophies. And, and both Ty and I were kind of in agreement that, you know, if we could do the old uh, Woody Hayes, you know, I think it was Woody Hayes, uh, football coach. Um, philosophy is, you know, hey, let's put up a let's put up a fence around Ohio and get all the best Ohio kids, um, and then, you know, uh, let's go out and, and try to supplement those kids with with some national kids and some international kids, and, and um, you know, by and large, we've been pretty successful um, with that. I mean, you know, the Ohio kids grow up; they've got a passion for Ohio State. You know, the university they grow up. Um, watching Ohio State football, so whether it's the Scott Greens and Ross Wilsons of the world, um, you know, they're more willing to, to, you know, bleed scarlet and gray, so to speak. Um, so that, that kind of helps. With, you know, it, it is, uh, you know, it's a lot of Ty's philosophy, but it's also a lot of uh, kids growing up with passion for, for the university. I mean, that's an Ohio State benefit, you know, one of the great benefits of coaching. Sure. In, in addition to the, the great facilities and re- resources, it's it's really one of the, the benefits is it kids grow up Ohio State fans and it makes the sell just that much easier. Sure, sure. What do you feel is the greatest benefit for these kids coming and playing at Ohio State? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you know, we hear all the time, you know, well, should, he, should a kid turn pro or should he go to college and that sort of thing? To me, the, the single greatest benefit is well, there are a couple things. To me personally, it, it's the teamwork. It's being part of a team. It's having a support system in place um, on the court, off the court. It's it you know the growth that comes during those college years. You know when you you see that the average age of the top hundred players is you know over the last seven or eight years has gone from twenty six years old to twenty nine years old, and you know those are those are grown men. And um, you know when you're eighteen and nineteen, it's tough to compete against that. So. Um, the other factor is just, you know, at the, these top programs now, they're, they're spending a lot of money on, on developing um, tennis players. And as, as you're very aware, it's not easy to go out and play pro tennis. So, and it, it's not just for the, the kids that are trying to go between turning pro or not. It's also the kids that just want to be the best tennis player they can be or be the best, most well-rounded student athlete they, they can be. Um, you know, things like dining tables and, and, you know, large travel budgets, large. Um, and then, you know, obviously this is, is, you know, I've spent enough time in Division Three and, and working with coaches all around the country. I mean, we're, we're very fortunate at some of the bigger Power Five conferences to have these budgets. But, you know, for a place like Ohio State, you know, the, 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 the university makes a huge financial commitment to every, every student that plays. I mean, I, I kind of tell kids that, you know, hey, it's, it's a hundred thousand dollars a year being spent on your tennis by the university. If you take in travel and coaching salaries, and court time and equipment and, and that sort of thing. I mean, you will, you will. And that, that last time I really kind of used that line was four or five years ago. So it's probably greater now. Yeah. Um, that's, that's so a lot of money. And I mean, it is. And, and you know, what's interesting hearing you talk about that. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I'm interrupting you. Um, is you mentioned the budget that Ohio State has. And coming from a smaller program, I would love for you to talk about what the big budget means and what it means to be at a school that doesn't have a big budget, how the players are directly impacted by that. Because that was a really big eye-opener for me when my son was going through recruiting and – you know, seeing the difference between a, a power five school, uh, you know, a top 20 school um, versus one outside of that. Right. Uh, I think it just eliminates a lot of the, you know, it's great for the kids because they, they have all the, you know, the best of everything. And for the coaches, I think it just, you know, it eliminates some of the worry. Um, you know, I know when I was at Kenyon college and we were, you know, top 12 in division three, um, we had tiny budgets, and so being able to go on spring break and, and where we had to have a, a good spring break to play top competition from around the country, um, you know, that, that was a big financial burden. And we had to ask, you know, for assistance from parents and, and um, 
We had to do all kinds of fundraising. And, and to be honest, that's, that's much more than norm that, you know, like you, you can take the 20 or 25 um, schools, but, you know, just in even talking to, to, to other coaches in, in the, um, in the big 10, I think there's, you know, some, some differences in budget sizes and things like that. So I think from a coaching standpoint, it just allows you more opportunity, allows you to not have to work, you know, spend your time worrying about things that a lot of other coaches are, are not as fortunate to do, um, you know, and, and so fundraising becomes a big, big part of, of um, the equation. Yeah. Um, and you've kind of lived through that kind of disconnect between the haves and the have nots in college tennis. I mean, you've, you've absolutely. been on both sides of it. And um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we don't, as parents, we don't often think about that piece of it and how it might impact our student athlete, how it might impact our own pocketbook. <laughs> but uh, there is definitely an impact there. Yeah. And, you know, and, and the good coaches are going to find, you know, not use any of anything as an excuse. If they, if they've got the have, they'll, they'll, you know, use that to the best of their benefit. And if they're more of a have not, then they, they won't use that as an excuse. I mean, I, I kind of, we've got been fortunate. A lot of our ex players are, are coaching around the country, whether it's Chris Klingerman at Northwestern who were off to play this week or Ross Wilson at Iowa, um, you know, Ty Schaub at Tennessee and, Brian Konyako at UCF. We've got uh, a lot of ex players, and, and kind of when they get frustrated, and, and and I'm talking to them about, well, you know, we're I don't have this or I don't have that. I, I kind of always come back to one line, and that is Brian Bolin won at Indiana State, and he, you know Brian Bolin played top 20 tennis at Indiana State, one of our very first big matches uh, at Ohio State. Our, uh, I think Ty and I second year, we we went in, we were probably 30 and five in the country, and we went in and played Indiana State in Terre Haute. And I remember Brian saying to us, you know, you're the first top 40 team we've ever had that would come to Terre Haute, <laughs> you know? So, and he won and he won big at, 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 um, at Indiana state. And we, we've seen what he's, he's gone on and done, you know, at Virginia and, and now at Baylor. So, you know, the, the, the best coaches will find a way. Um, but <laughs> it, it sure is more fun to, to, to be have than a have not <laughs> most of the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's transition and get into the meat of this conversation, which is Wilson Collegiate Tennis Camps and Premier Sports Camps. And how did you get started in the camp business and why did you get started in the camp business? Yeah, like um, it, it kind of segues nicely from what we were talking about before. So my father was a college coach at the College of Worcester, which is a, a small uh, Division three program here in Ohio. And he had, uh, you know, he had a perennial top 20 team and, and his, um, he started a camp back in the eighties and, um, you know, and the, uh, idea for him was it was more about, um, you know, a- a using it as a way to find recruits, you know, how can I find some kids from around Ohio and, and, you know, if I can get them to come to my camp then then, you know, maybe they'll be familiar with Worcester and, and myself and, and that will help in the recruiting process. So he kind of started a camp at the College of Worcester, and, and I went to that camp when I was, you know, uh, in high school, and then I started working at the camp when I was in college, and I just, I, I just loved it. I mean, I loved going there. I loved working there. I loved being around it. Um, you know, I had a lot of passion for the camp, and so, you know, as I got into my coaching career, I realized as well, I, you know, more so than recruiting, you, you don't get paid a lot in Division Three. So as I was making it my career, um, I needed a way to supplement my income. And so, you know, I started up my own camps um, that were kind of, you know, curtailed off of my father's camps and and, um, and then just kind of built one up, and, um, you know, at Kenyon College originally. And then I moved it over to the College of Worcester. And, and uh, I, I just found myself thinking about it all year round and working on it all year round and how can I make it better? And how can, you know, how can we make this the best camp experience? And so um, along the way, I, you know, I, I have a lot of coaches say, well, you know, you, you've gotten yourself 300 overnight camps at this tiny little overnight campers at this tiny little school in Ohio. How, you know, how have you done it? Can you help me? And so I started working with a, a couple other schools and then, um, you know, then we, we approached Wilson about uh, I guess almost 10 years ago, about nine years ago. And kind of told them our vision, and you know we kind of wanted to roll out a, a camp that is centered around colleges and the college tennis experience, and 
you know, uh, one of the, the key ideas has always been that, you know, I want to build passion for college tennis. You know, that's the other part of my life. It's, it's, it's camps and college tennis, and I've got passion for both of them. Um, so I said, well, you know, God, if I can get more kids on campus and more kids to these colleges, that will get them motivated to play college tennis. And at the very least, it will get them motivated to go to college and to say, wow, what, what a special, you know, what a special place this college is or that college is. And, and um, so we, you know, we differentiated ourselves a little bit um, from some of our competition by just saying, look, we're going to do this exclusively on college campuses. We put the collegiate in the, in the name to, to kind of tie in that we wanted to work, you know, with the top college coaches on beautiful college campuses um, and expose kids to, to, um, to kind of the collegiate lifestyle. You know, a camp at its best is, 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 you know, just about everything other than tennis as much as it is about tennis. You know, kids get away from home if they're going to an overnight camp and get to, um, you know, experience, you know, independence and life on their own and eating at dining hall and understanding how dorms work and living in a dorm and meeting friends, new friends from around the country, you know, that, you know, with our camps around the world that, that are, you know, can be very different from, from what they're exposed to, you know, in their, in their own schools or their own hometowns. Sure. Did, your, uh, did your son go to camp? I, th- I think he did, didn't he? Growing yeah, up? I mean, my listeners have heard this story a million times, but when my son was nine, he one of his buddies asked him if he wanted to go to University of Georgia tennis camp for a week. And so the two of them went and roomed together there. And by the end of that session, well, let me just back up. When he went, John Isner was still on the team. And oh, okay. so yeah. John, the last day of camp, John got on the court and served and gave each of the campers an <laughs> opportunity to try and return his serve. Well, my son came home from that first year of camp experience saying, this is it. I want to play college tennis and I want to play at University of Georgia and I love it here. And this is my goal. I don't care about turning pro. That's not what I'm interested in. I just want to play college tennis. I want to be like John Isner. And he didn't wind up going to Georgia. He wound up going out to California, but I mean, it, it, it really shaped his whole junior tennis career. And that, and that's, that is, is my number one hope. Like, you know, I, I tell parents all the time that, you know, they'll be like, well, how much time are they going to spend, you know, say Georgia, how much time are they going to spend with coach Diaz or how much time are they going to spend with coach Smith at, 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 um, at USC. USC. And, and, yeah. and that can vary. Um, but, but our ultimate goal at all the Wilson collegiate tennis camps is, and I tell parents this very openly is, you know, more importantly than what we can teach them in five days, because we have your kids for five days. The reality of it is that they're going to hit more balls than they're used to hitting and probably more than they'll hit in most months. But if I can build their passion, if I can put a, a great camp program together where they have social and recreational activities off the court and the tennis on the court is fun as well as instructional, um, then they'll build a passion for tennis. And, and that is the single biggest thing that we can do for a kid. If we can just exactly what you're, what you're saying with your son, it, it then became his sport. Yeah. Um, and, and that is much more valuable than, you know, you know, if they're doing 30 out, 30 private lessons where you're in for an hour and out for an hour and that sort of thing. It, it is just, if we can build that passion and, and we see, you know, I see it firsthand with, with hundreds and hundreds of kids every summer. And that's, that's kind of get, what gets me up every morning at five to, to keep, keep, keep pushing um, the camps and getting more kids exposed to it. So uh, who, so. who are the camps for what age, what level, et cetera? We take kids as, as young as, as five at some of our locations. And typically they just go up to 18 years old. And so we'll match kids up with, with, with kids of similar age and experience. So it's all skill levels. We'll, we'll have kids at, at camp that are, um, you know, 11 UTR, uh, so, or, you know, let's just say very experienced national players. Um, we'll have very good players, you know, nationally ranked players, but then we'll have absolute beginners. And so we kind of tailor our programs to, to the needs of each kid. So it's not just like one formula where you come in and everybody's doing the same thing, you know, with, a, with the absolute beginners, it, it's much more, you know, emphasis on swing technique and, you know, and keeping it fun and, getting, you know, lots of, of repetitions in, 
But, you know, building, giving them a, a strong fundamental base. And, and sometimes it's the very first time they've heard any of this. You know, we've had people show up without rackets and, and are 100 percent new. And that, that's great because, you know, there, there's a, a blank canvas for us to impress you know, how great a sport that we're all involved in. And, um, and then like, and then it's all the way up to the, the top players. We, we treat those kids much like we do over their college practices. And that's why we work with, with, you know, all college coaches at our, our camps, you know, they're all directed by college coaches. And, and so they can accommodate, you know, every level of player. And, um, you know, so the, the more advanced kids are getting much more strategy and point building and mental side and conditioning and, we talked to them about the importance of scheduling and, and, you know, all the, all the same things that we're doing on our college campuses. Right. And right. so, you know, really tailoring the program that we're offering and, and by program, I mean, within each camp um, to the, to the level of players is kind of the, the secret sauce that we try to emphasize. And, you know, and I think the coach is really, you know, for a, for a Peter Smith, who's won five national champions, we do a camp at the USC with him or David Roditi and, you know, the names at TCU, the names go on and on. Um, you know, I think they enjoy working with all, all levels of players. You know, you, you kind of get in in college tennis. You're fortunate to work with some of the best players in the, in the world in a lot of cases. And, um, you know, new sets of challenges with, with beginners and the intermediates and, you know, working with younger kids and, and you know, enjoying the time that, that, that you spend, you know, with, with those sensibilities and senses of humor. I mean, I, I think it's, for, for most coaches, that's a, a great change of pace and a lot of fun for them. Is and a lot there... of them have a lot of, oh, lot, go ahead. A lot of them have a lot, yeah, a lot of them have a lot of passion. I was just talking to Grant Chen the other day. He's the new head men's coach. He was at UCLA for a long time. I'm sure you know Grant. And, uh, but new head coach at SMU, and we're doing a new startup camp at SMU in Dallas. And, and uh, you know, very first conversation I had with Grant when we started talking about camps is like, I, I, I'm a camper. I, I was a camper. It was the best time of my summer and my number one goal as a camp director is I, I want to make it the best best week of, of every kid's summer because it was for mine. And, and just like you were saying, your son son had that experience. So, you know, I, you'd be surprised how many coaches really have that, that same philosophy as well. Yeah, that's great to hear. Yes. And I know Grant very well. And um, I have watched him in action at summer camp when he was at UCLA. And I, in fact, my niece went to UCLA summer camp. And um, I can attest to how great he is with those kids on the court. He's amazing with especially the little ones. But um, can we talk a little bit about who is working with the kids at the camps? Obviously, you said the college coach, him or herself is there, but they can't manage 100 kids, 200 kids. So who else is working with the kids? So it's a, it's a wide variety of other college coaches and, and top collegiate players. You know, we do get some high school coaches involved as, you know, kind of secondary coaches and things like that um, and some teaching pros, but it's primarily college coaches and college players. And um, to be honest with you, probably the most successful ones we have are, are the, the college kids, you know, the college players, because, you know, it becomes a very aspirational thing. So the young you know, for the young players, the high school kids want to grow up and be like, you know, these college players, whether they're division three players or, or, you know, division one, all American. Um, so, you know, they're able to relate and they're able to, you know, really bring out the best in a lot of these kids. Um, and so, and, and I've, I've hired, I've run camps where I've hired nothing but head coaches. Um, and sometimes those are, are good. And sometimes it's, it's you know, it's hard to get a, a bunch of strong-willed college coaches on the same page. Um, and, you know, just in my 30 years of doing camps, you know, the, my, my experience is that, you know, the the younger kids all the way up to the high school kids really kind of relate with a lot of the college college players just as much as the college coaches. So the college coaches will come in and, and you know, and work on the camps and be on the courts and, and kind of move around different groups and, you know, try to have a, a touch point with all of them. Uh, but, but most importantly, set the, you know, set the tone and set the agenda and, and kind of, um, you know, make sure, you know, they're, you're, you're buying into their vision. And obviously these are successful coaches because you don't, you know, you don't become a college coach at the level most of these coaches are at unless you're, you know, very, not, not only understand tennis, but understand how to put programs together. And, sure. you know, the pro- programming component is, is very important. And, you know, and they're also older, older and mature enough, and really understand, you know, 
Um, I, I kind of tell every parent that, you know, first and foremost is I can make no guarantees on how much better your kid's going to get. But my number one guarantee to you is that everything, first and foremost, is about safety. So, you know, we've got systems in place and security, you know, on at the camp, on, you know, campus security and all those sort of things. So we're going to provide your kids with a, you know, a very safe environment. So, um, yeah, so it, it is. You know, the, the college coach is setting the tone and, and being on the court and working with him. But, but I'm also, we're also very upfront is if you're going to Peter, you know, Peter Smith's camp and he's got 50 or 60 other kids, then you're going to get about 150th of Peter Smith's time. But you're, you're also going to have all these other great coaches and great players who have learned from Peter Smith. So, it, you know, it kind of trickles down to that effect. Sure. Um, and so, you know, we're very transparent about that. And again, it, it, you know, Good, a good program with, with good staff. I know me personally, I run the camp at the College of Worcester. I, I look for, you know, personality as much as everything. You know, we, we handpick our, our coaches on their ability to, to relate to kids. Do they communicate well? Are they able to express, you know, what, what we're working on and what we're teaching? And, and, and are they fun to be around? And if they're fun to be around, the kids will have fun. And, and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about before. Then they'll be, you know, They'll they'll have a they'll get better over a much longer period of time because tennis becomes their sport. Right, right. For the kids that are in high school or getting ready to enter high school, how does being at a camp on a college campus kind of jibe with the NCAA rules and contact rules and all of that? And how do you guys yeah, so make sure that you're in compliance? Yeah, and so we, we all have compliance departments, and everything is run through com- the, um, our compliance departments and um, for interpretations and that sort of thing. The, the number one thing that has to be in place is, is the camp has to be open to any and all. So for, you know, Ryan Satchery to run a camp at, at um, University of Notre Dame, the camp has to be open to any and all. He can't restrict it to, okay, you've got to be top 20 in the country or you've got to be – uh, top 40 in the country. It, you can only restrict your enrollment by um, by age and gender. So you could have an all-boys camp or an all-girls camp, or you could limit enrollment by, you know, ages 8 to 12, for instance. So uh, only restricted by age and and, um, and um, gender. So therefore, the, the camps are considered what's considered open to any and all. So um, we, we don't have any camps that, that are, are based on you. Ha- you have to be you know, ranked X, Y, or Z to, to qualify. And and that keeps us in compliance. That's the number. I mean, there's a, you know, whole handbook full, full of little things. Right. But, right. But, <laughs> which I'm happy to send you. Uh, yeah. uh, no, thank would, you. <laughs> yeah. that, would, uh, that would be the number one camp concern is that they're all okay. open. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the NCAA, you know, the compliance rules are open to interpretation, which makes it very challenging. And um, so I, you know, I, I, commend you for staying on top of all that and um, doing what you need to do to make sure that everybody's on, on board with, you know, following the rules and, and not putting anybody in jeopardy with that. So I, in terms of the high school kids, it's fine for them to be at these camps on the college campuses. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, you know, it, it is, our attendance is, is all across the nationwide is almost a, a perfect bell curve where you're, the top of the bell is probably 15 years old. But we get, we get hundreds and hundreds of, of um, you know, really good high school players. And, and, you know, our kind of sweet spot is where you're going to get a, a lot of kids or are kids that are, you know, 14, 15 years old. They're either on their varsity high school team and, and trying to get better or, or, you know, they're trying to make their high school varsity team. Um, but like I said, then we do have specialty camps. Um, you know, like Notre Dame has what's called our national camps, um, and those are kind of a, a more advanced curriculum. So we can change the curriculum around a little bit and make it a little bit more advanced so we get a higher level of player. It's still open to any and all. So, you know, absolute beginner could come to that camp, but, we, you know, we kind of just try to talk to the parents and, and make sure they understand that, you know, that the intensity of the, of the practices is going to be a little bit more um, geared toward advanced player um, and therefore a little bit more – intense. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And, you know, we do want to add Indiana University with, with Jeremy Wurtzman, Coach Wurtzman there, and, and that's called a match play camp. Um, Allison Swain at USC does uh, three one-day camps at USC, which are really kind of exciting camps where, 
You know, one is a, a, a UTR camp. So it, it's really kind of an emphasis on UTR and understanding UTR, um, playing matches that, that count for their UTR ratings. So a lot of our camps uh, will submit all the scores to UTR. So, you know, coming to a Wilson Collegiate Tennis Camp can, can kind of help them improve their uh, UTR rating. Um, she's got kind of a college game day camp where it, it replicates, you know, all the things that they do um, with the USC women's um, tennis teams, everything from meeting before matches to going out and playing a, you know, a, a collegiate match between, you know, various teams. So, you know, we do have camps that are, are designed for more advanced level players as well around the country. Got it. That sounds so much fun. Allison's an amazing coach. So I, oh, that's really, really cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how important is it for an aspiring college player to go to a camp on a campus where he or she wants to play? Um, you know, it's one of those ones that, you know, I, I would be disingenuous if I said, oh, it's, it's critical because it's, it's not critical. You know, most of, most of the kids um, I, on most of the teams around the country probably never went to a camp there, but it certainly does give you some advantages. And the biggest advantage is it really gives you a feel for the campus, you know, how, you know, what are the facilities like? What are the dorms like? What is the food like? Um, and it, then it does expose you to um, the college coaches as well. You know, if you, if you want to go to um, Colorado College and, and get to know Anthony Weber, who's, who's the camp director there, you know, and, and you might not be on his radar yet, that, that's a great way for him to, to get to know you. And, and we talked about earlier today about how much fit and, and um, is an important part of college recruiting and uh, going on and, and spending time on their campus and getting to know the coaches. I mean, there really is no better, better, you know, job interview for lack of a better term right. than, than getting to know the coaches. And, and again, it goes both, you know, fortunately it goes both ways. Now I think there are some sports, you know, we at premier sports camps, we do more than tennis, but um, you know, there, there are some sports like lacrosse and, and, and football even, and, and, um, and soccer that, you know, going to their campus is, is a much higher um, level of importance than it is in a sport like tennis, but, mm -hmm. but it can be a great, you know, it can be a great thing. And most importantly, like, like we've talked about is, is that it, it gives you exposure to the collegiate lifestyle. Right. Right. What are some of the things that you hear from the coaches after these camps? I mean, what are some of the things they enjoy about running the camps and, Maybe some of, if there are any, maybe there aren't any negatives to running the camps. Yeah, I think the, the, the biggest thing we hear time and again is just how much fun they have. You know, it's just such a different experience from their 50 or 48 other weeks of the year where they're working with the same, you know, 8 to 10 to 12 players. And, they're, you know, those players are all, you know, a certain type of personality and they've kind of formed their own you know, identity that they get all these kids from all around the country at different ages and different personalities. And I mean, for me personally, uh, it, the kids are what makes the camp. I mean, you know, it, it is, they never cease to amuse me, you know, in, in, every, in every sense of the word, you know, and uh, it, it kind of makes you young again. And you kind of, you know, you kind of realize that, you know, you, you remember back to like when you were a college or I'm sorry, a, you know, a, a camper on a, on college campus and, you know, how you try to order pizza after bed check or, you, you know, just whatever it is that the, you know, the, the kids like to do or just the interaction with, the, with each other. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the only complaints we really hear about the, um, the, <laughs> the, the long days in the heat sometimes. But, um, you know, I, I, I really, I don't think there's a whole lot of downside for, for most of the coaches. I think it, it's a great change of pace for them. And it's, you know, and it keeps them, it keeps their, their chops, um, you know, kind of fresh. It's, it's easy right. to, to get kind of set in your ways. And, you know, especially if you're working at a camp and you've got other college coaches working with you, then, you know, you get new ideas. And, you know, sometimes these kids have different, you know, at least for like myself at, at Ohio State, I get spoiled. You know, when you work with a J.J. Wolf or a John McNally, you kind of get spoiled, you know. <laughs> and, uh you know, you tell these kids one time to do something and they can do it. And you're like, Oh God, look how good a coach I am. You know, and, and <laughs> you get, uh, you know, you get that, uh, you get with some of these other kids and, and it, uh, it takes more than one or two reps. Yeah. So, uh, 
you know, so I, it, it, I, I think it makes you a better coach. I really do. I think working with a variety of different levels of players and, and, you know, fitting the pieces together where you can see improvement in a short amount of time. And you, most importantly, you can get a, a you know, a young player to, to believe that they're, they're making improvement. That's, sure. that's extremely rewarding. So when the kids aren't on the tennis court hitting balls, what are they doing? Yeah, we, we try to keep them busy. This is another thing I tell parents all the time. We try to keep your biz, your kids busy, like at the overnight camp, for instance, from 7.30 in the morning till 10.30 at night. So we'll have social and recreational activities um, every every um, day, you know, and that could be anything from like a bowling night to casino night to taking them to the pool, taking them to the movies, um, all kinds of social activities, you know, kickball in the afternoon, um, you know, capture the flag, all, all kinds of things. So basically, we, we don't want to give them a lot of downtime. Um, you know, young minds with downtime, can, that's where you run into, to, to, you find out who the cleverest kids are. Uh-huh. So we, we really do try to try to keep them busy from, from 7.30 in the morning until 10.30 at night. You know, between, you know, at, at our camps up at the College of Worcester, for instance, you know, we have three tennis sessions a day. You know, the, the breaks in between are about an hour and a half or two hours. Um, so there's not a lot of downtime. We're doing things like off court, um, video analysis during some of that. We're giving them a little bit of relaxation time. We've got social activities lined up. You know, if we have talent shows and things like that, then a lot of times the kids are working on their talent show skits. So, um, it, it's our goal to, to, to wear them out before 1030 and, and to keep them extremely busy, both on the courts and off the courts. And I, I think that's really kind of been the key to our success is that we, we really do want it to be a full day experience, um, whether it's a day camp or a, an overnight camp. And, and that it's not just like, okay, well, you, you know, be back on the course at six and then they have two and a half hours with nothing planned. I mean, most of our camps have to have everything planned all the mm-hmm. way throughout the day. You touched on the concern with safety and making sure the kids are secure and safe on the campuses. For the overnight camps, can you talk a little bit about the chaperones and what happens in the dorms? Yeah. So, you know, most of our dorms are either separated by gender. uh, The dorm is boys in one dorm and girls in another or by floor. Um, And then mostly we, we keep all our camps small enough. So it's typically a five to one ratio. So all the staff typically will stay in the dorms with the kids. So, you know, you really have, we're not trying to monitor 20 kids for one, um, for one coach. So when you've got 50 kids and you've got 12 coaches in, in the, um, in the dorms, then you keep a pretty good eye on them. Um, a lot of, our, you know, most of our schools have obviously full-time security staff, but you going back to USC, you know, it's a, it's a gated, you know, campus. So nobody else can kind of get in there. They have their full-time security staff. A lot of schools, a lot of the colleges, and that's another reason why we really like to be on college campuses because they're they're set up for, for summer activities and, and with not only their full-time security staff, but a lot of them will hire what's called camp security. So, you know, if they have they may have a soccer camp, a lacrosse camp, a swim camp, a volleyball camp, a science camp, and a computer camp all on campus at the same time. Well, they'll hire summer staff that really all they do is just keep an eye on, on the kids and make sure all the dorms are locked and make sure all, you know, everybody's where there needs to be and that there's no, nobody on campus that shouldn't be on campus. Um, so, you know, they're, they're very safe environments and, um, you know, the safety is stressed from the very first staff meeting all the way through the, the last day of camp. And, and that's where, you know, it, it's my job to really handpick the directors that we partner with very closely. We, you know, we, we are looking for, you know, experienced, um, you know, camp directors. So mm-hmm. you know, most of our, our coaches have been doing camps for many, many years. The, the ones that do come on and kind of are, are new, new coaches or new camp directors, they have worked at camps for years. So they kind of know, you know, what to look for and, and how to make sure that they're providing a safe environment. Right, right. So how many camps do y'all run? Uh, well, this summer we've got, I think, 31 tennis camps, local wow. camps and, and well over 100 some sessions, you know, figuring each one has, you know, anywhere from one session all the way up to our camp at the University of Pennsylvania has um, nine sessions. Wow. Um, uh, so, and, and everywhere in between. So, yeah. you know, probably 100. I, I, I never try to count them because it, it, uh, it's better that I don't. Yeah. <laughs> 
So let me ask this question. Let's say a family is considering doing one of your camps this summer, but you know, they have to make a decision. Do I send my kid to one of these camps or do I send my kid to an extra tournament? Um, You know, how do I weigh out the pros and cons of each as a college coach? What is your thought on that? Is it better for a kid to play one more tournament or is it better for them to take a week and, and go to a camp? Yeah, I I think whatever is going to build more passion with a kid is, is the the best answer to that. I mean, I'd love to selfishly tell you, Oh, go to camp, you know, one more tournament is not going to matter. But maybe if if that's what really drives the the student and, you know, competing and, and playing in a tournament and having a great result is, is, what will push him to play another tournament or to practice harder than the next week, then, then I would say, you know, hey, the tournament's probably the right answer. Um, I think most times, though, I really honestly believe that most times a, a camp experience is such a unique experience, and it's just so much fun. And I think if you, if you, you know, interviewed a lot of the kids, that, you know, 95% of the kids that came through camp, they'd be like, oh, my God, that's so fun. I, I can't wait to go back next year. Um, so, you know, one of the, but, but on the, on the flip side of that, you know, the, the camps are kind of expensive. I mean, one of the real regrets that I have, and, and one of the things I was just telling some of my players last week on our trip that, you know, I, I get, you know, I, I get about 200 act, actionable emails a day. So I'm going to email all day long. So, but, you know, I got a, a nice email from a, uh, a young lady. She was probably 15 years old. And she's like, Hey, I just started playing tennis about a year ago. I absolutely love it. It's my favorite thing in the world. Um, you know, but there's just absolutely no way that my family could afford to send me to camp. Do you have any scholarships? And unfortunately, one of the going back to the NCA compliance things, we're, we are not allowed to administer scholarships. We do give scholarships away to the USTA, and they can administer them, but we can't. You know, we can't have for NCA reasons. We can't have any involvement in picking who gets a scholarship and who doesn't because. You know, like most things, there would be a small proportion of coaches that may abuse that. Um, so, you know, but the camps are expensive, and, and that kind of breaks my heart because I, I wish everybody could be exposed to it. Um, but on the, the flip side, it's, it's tournaments that don't seem to be <laughs> appear to be getting any no. cheaper either. No, and, they and are not. You know, much, much like college, you know, the, the schools, and most of the expense, the parents always ask me, well, what's the, why, are, why are the camps so expensive, or why are the camps cost X, Y, and Z? And really, the the reason is the schools charge a lot. You know, they, 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 their costs go up, and, and, you know, it's just unfortunately nothing on a college campus is appearing to get much more <laughs> affordable. Right. Um, but we try to keep our things, you know, we don't do a lot of discounts. We don't do a lot of, of that sort of thing because we, we absolutely try to keep our, our costs to a bare minimum. And, you know, when we look at our competition, it's rare that we're not at least 100 or $200 cheaper than our competition. And Interesting. That, and that's, that's really been a goal of mine since day one. My, my uh, father had it, like I said, when he started his camp, he had a much more altruistic um, goal. Um, mine was a little bit more, you know, business-minded, just out of necessity at that point in my life. Um, so, you know, the, 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 our, our business is kind of built somewhere in between where we, we you know, we try to make it as, as affordable as we can for everybody and not try to trick people into a bunch of discounts or reward certain people. We, we want to keep the cost to, to as much because, you know, there's, there's, I, I don't know of a single college that will give you a discount, whether a brother and sister comes to, together or, right. you know, or a, a, a student comes for, you know, their, their costs are set across the board. And I've worked with 75 schools around the nation and um, to, to, you know, they, they require deposits and, and, you know, it, it's very, it's very, clear cut with them. So we don't, you know, we're not afforded a lot of um, opportunities to, to, you know, we just want to try to keep the, the costs as, as uh, low as possible for everybody rather than a bunch of discounts. But that is, you know, kind of getting back to your question, that is one of the, the, the concerns that I have is, you know, the, the, the camps price some kids out that really, you know, I, I feel would benefit greatly from going to, to camp. Well, you mentioned USTA scholarships. How do kids go about applying for those? Yeah, they, they have each section. Um, I don't know if there's a central clearinghouse. I don't think there is. I think each section on the USDA. So if you're in the middle states and you go on the USDA.com and then click on the middle state section, they'll have a camp link on their page. And, and usually there's something on there applied to, to, um, 
apply for scholarship. And it's not only our camps that have scholarships on there. There's some independent camps and there's some of our other competitors that offer up scholarships as well. And, and um, so, but any, any of, the, of the ones on college campuses, they, they, you know, they'll be run through an, an outside organization, whether it be the USTA or, you know, another on the approved list that kind of takes the, the decisions of who gets the scholarships out of our hands. Got it. I, I mean, I had no idea that existed, and that's really good information to have. So yeah, yeah, no, parents, if you're is. listening, check that out, because I I mean, if if the scholarships are sitting there, everybody should use them. I mean, there's no reason for them to go unused. Absolutely. And sometimes, you know, what's, what's strange to me is, is sometimes we even get kids that, that win the scholarship and their parents are real excited and then they never come to camp. You know? Wow. Well. <laughs> um, you know, it happens three or four times a year, and I'm like, you know, that, that makes me kind of uh, a little sad, too, just because, you know, I'm sure there's another student that would have loved to, to take it Yeah, but, yeah, yeah <laughs> so, that's, that's that, terrible. That, that makes me scratch my head a little bit at times. Uh, yeah, I would say. All right, we're coming to the end of our hour, David Schilling. So let's um, share with the listeners how well, they can get information. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, before we do, I got, I've got one question for you. Oh, so gosh. When, uh, when your when your son went to uh, to camp with with Coach Diaz at, at Bulldog Tennis Camp, there little plug to him who's not even in, in our system, but uh, <laughs> Coach Diaz is a great coach and a great guy. And um, uh, hopefully, soon enough, of John Isner, they had you sign supplemental waivers for that. <laughs> no, or, or gave, gave your son a, a helmet or something. Like that. I, mean, I, I don't got, think I, the... I've known John for a long time. He's had pinpoint accuracy, but you know. One, I don't think the ball came anywhere ball. near those kids. It hit the <laughs> okay. hit in the box and it bounced into the stands. And that was, I swear <laughs> to God, that's what my son remembered and talked about for months afterward is the ball hit the hit the court and it was gone and didn't even see it. <laughs> yeah, well, as somebody that runs camp year round at all kinds and has thousands and thousands of kids every summer, it, it would be those scenarios that would keep me up at night. Yeah. What if John misses and, and hits a kid with his 130 mile an hour serve, or 150 <laughs> mile an hour serve for that matter. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Yeah. All right. Well, so getting back to you, um, how can people get more information on the camps? What's your website? How do they sign up? Et cetera, yeah, et everything's on our. Uh, the easiest thing is just direct everybody to our website, which is WilsonTennisCamps.com. Um, Wilson's our sponsor, um, and they they do an incredible job. We work very closely with them, Wilson Sporting Goods. They send all the latest equipment down to us every year, and, and so we've got all the latest rackets, the new Clash that, that everybody's raving about. Come on. We'll have a, we'll ha- yeah, we'll have all of those on campus, and they give us great prizes and, you know, racket, you know, drawings and things like that, and um, just a, a whole lot of equipment and support, and um, we're very tightly uh, integrated with Wilson. So it's Wilson, uh, tennis and, uh, all the information are there, all the locations and the prices and the fees and the times and, uh, information about the coaches and there's contact forms, you know, if you want to reach out to me and, and all the emails do go through me. So I, I, I will respond to everybody, you know, 99% of them within 24 hours, you know, um, having done camps as long as I have, I, you know, I want to have a personal touch point really kind of, as you can see, I'm no shortage of words. So yeah, no, that's great. <laughs> and, and to the listeners know that we'll have links uh, in the show notes on parentingaces.com. So if you didn't write down the website, it will be right in the show notes and you can click and go straight to their page and reach out to David. I'll have a link to the contact form as well. And David, is it okay if I share your email to you? Yeah, absolutely, David, okay. at premiersportscamps.com. And, um, you know, congratulations on you. I, um, I see just today that your your new membership is going up. Yeah, so, yeah, it's an Saturday exciting days. change for Parenting Aces. That, so we'll see that how that exciting. goes. Yeah, yeah we're, we're hopeful that we can, uh, we can do something together. I've been a big fan of, of your site, and I've been listening to your, I think I told you earlier in the year, I, I drove all the way across the country with my dogs this summer. and listening to to many of your podcasts all along the way. That's awesome. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for your support and for the wonderful camps that you run. And, and I, I really hope everyone who's listening will click on the link, go to Wilson tennis. Wait, tell me it again. I just said it right. Wilson. 
Yeah, do WilsonTennisCamps.com. WilsonTennisCamps.com. W-I-L-S-O-N-T-E-N-N-I-S-C-A-M-P-S. Yep, so. WilsonTennisCamps.com. Please click on the link. Take a look at the camps. I cannot say enough good things about these camps and the impact that they have on these players. And even if your kid is a high, high level, nationally ranked player, internationally ranked player, give them the opportunity to take a week away from their regular routine and go to a camp and hang out with their buddies and be on a college campus. It is so worth it. And it will, I promise you, be one of the highlights of their junior tennis years. So uh, I hope all of you will take advantage of that. David Schilling, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing your experience in tennis and college tennis and coaching and running camps. And I just wish you continued success with everything. Yeah, you too. Thank, thank you so much, Lisa. I look forward to, uh, to catching up and hopefully we'll see you at, uh, down at, uh, the, the nationals this year. I think you and I run into each other every year down at the NCAA championship. Absolutely. I, I just booked my ticket actually, so I will be there. <laughs> okay. Well, we're, we're hoping the Buckeyes will be there too. I'm sure y'all will be. Y'all are having a great year. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lisa. And to my listeners, thanks so much for tuning in. We'll catch you next time on Parenting Aces. I'm Lisa Stone, and you've been listening to the Parenting Aces podcast. For tennis parents, by a tennis parent. If you like what you've heard, I hope you'll share the podcast with your tennis community. For all the information you need to navigate the junior and college tennis journey, be sure to check out ParentingAces.com.